Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Um, I loud enough? I think okay. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Okay, good. Bruce, I, I just want to thank the organizers, um, not only for giving me a chance to talk, but also for putting together a really wonderful conference. Um, the only word I can think of is multifaceted from all different directions and all different, uh, um, you know, ways of looking at Girdle's theorem. Thank you. So, so it's, it's really a success. So let's, let's go through it. Um, I just want to go through what the abstract was and point out a few things. Some of the most profound and famous theorems in mathematics and computer science of the past 150 years can simultaneously, simultaneously be seen as a consequence of diagonalization, as a fixed point theorem, and as an instance of self-referential paradox. These results include Cantor's theorem, Russell's paradox, Girdle's incompleteness theorem, Turing's halting problem, and much more. Amazingly, all these diverse theorems and all viewpoints can be seen as instances of a single simple theorem in basic category theory. Uh, we describe this theorem and show some of the instances. A large part of the talk will be a discussion of diagonalization proofs and fixed point theorems that fail to be instances of this categorical theorem. So this is going a little bit further than that, things that are not this categorical thing. And we will meet another categorical idea that unifies some of those instances. No category theory is needed for this talk. Um, uh, uh, you're going to see a lot of things here that um, I just want to say, uh, okay, so let's go the outline of the talk. I'm going to talk about from Epimenides all the way to Levere. Levere was the one who formulated this, this categorical theorem. Then we'll talk a little bit of previous work. Um, and then I'm going to have a, a philosophical interlude where defending the use of category theory, why, why, why category theory is necessary for this. Um, and then we'll talk about some other things which do not fit in. Um, and then we'll talk about natural number objects and, and trying to fit in these things that don't fit in to fit them in, in some context with some, something called a natural number object. Okay. Um, so again, no category theory is ne necessary and anything, you know, advanced, you know, any advanced category theory, um, I will introduce. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm sure every one of you have seen every, every one of these things. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time teaching you all about teaching about these uh, different self-referential paradoxes. My, my goal here is not to teach them. And, and again, some of you might not know them and, and, and you'll see some of them here. My goal is not to teach them to you, but to, rather to show that they all have the same format. Okay. And they can all be seen from, from one single format. So, um, it goes back 2,600 years to Epimenides of Crete, and he said all Cretans are liars, or this sentence is false. And we're going to have a, the the red lines are going to be self-referential statements. Okay, our 26. I'm going to be a little bit quick with this. The 2,600 uh, year tour um, then goes on to Gödel, and Gödel showed these different um, sizes of sets. In particular, the set n is smaller than the set 0, 1. I'm going to do this slowly, and as we go on further and further, I'm going to motivate Levere's theorem and, and bring in new points of Levere's theorem till at the end we're going to see Levere, and I'm going to show you how all these different parts fit in. Okay, The set n is smaller than the set uh, than the 0, 1, the interval 0, 1. Another way of saying this is there cannot exist a surjection from the natural numbers to 0, 1. Another way of saying this is for every purported su surjection, there is some number g sub h, it's going to depend on this purported, this supposed surjection, that is not in the image of h, that is not in the image of h, so which means it's not surjective. Okay, so let's let's go through it. For every purported subjection, there is an infinite matrix. Now you've all you've all seen this and you've all taught it, but I'm just going to bring in the notation. So I wrote the real numbers down, and you'll see why in a second. And here's the digits, and here's this purported subjection. So we have this 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 function f sub h, which is this purported subjection of real numbers and the natural numbers. Here's your natural numbers, uh, here's your natural numbers, and, and here's the real numbers. Okay, we can think of this infinite matrix as a function, okay? Rather than thinking of it as a matrix, think of it as a function. It goes from the natural numbers across the natural numbers to the set 10, okay, which consists of digits, literally digits, which depends on h. And here's the, 
I mean, here you saw it, but here's an exact definition. F of H at the mth row in the nth column is the mth digit of H of N. The diagonal, okay, great. So, but you all know the next step, we're going to change the diagonal. So how do you change the diagonal? The diagonal is changed with a function alpha from 10 to 10. This is the set 10, which is defined as follows. It changes things, okay? The most important feature of alpha is, and of course, there's a lot of different alphas. You can change things in many different ways, but the most important thing is that alpha does not have a fixed point. There are many such functions, okay? So that's the main point, is it doesn't have a fixed point, okay? And so we have the same thing, but here I change the diagonal, okay? And this change diagonal, 0 0.12113, da, 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 is not on the list, okay? And you know why it's not on the list. It's not in the first column, it's not in the second column, it's not in the third column. And you can formulate, the, formulate it as a self-reference to, you can formulate this number as somehow being self-referential in the following sense. I am not a column, I am not on column n because my nth digit is different from the nth column, the nth column's nth digit. Or you can say it even succinctly, I'm not in the image of H. Okay, so this number is, this real number between zero and one is not in the image of H. Conclusion, G of H is not on our list and hence H is not subjective. Okay, so we saw some of the ingredients to this so far. Okay, we're gonna do the Barber paradox, which again, you've all seen, but let's just do it close similar. So again, we're gonna have this matrix and we're gonna think of, um, the the set vill for villages consists of all villages in the village the function villages cross villages to 2 2 is a boolean 1 and 0 okay and it's defined as follows if you have a one villager and another villager it's 1 if the hair of v is cut by v prime it's 0 if the hair of v is not cut by v prime and you have this village ordinance that says anybody who doesn't cut their own hair has to go to the single barber. So f of v comma v is equal to one if and only if f of v comma barber is zero. So if they do not go to the barber, then they cut their own hair. And this is perfect and it works out very nice for every v, including the barber. And then you get this contradiction. Okay. But again, we can see this. Um, I'm uh, sorry. Okay. We can, I want to go further with this and show you how we're going to get this diagonal. So where there's a function called delta, which goes from villages to villages cross villages, and it's defined delta of V is equal to V comma V. This is the core of self-reference. In other words, what you're going to do is you're going to think of this F function as evaluating, looking at the relationship between the villagers and this delta function, which is going to say, okay, I don't only want to look at the relationship of the villages, I want to look at the relationship to themselves, okay? Okay, so this, this delta is the core of self-references, okay? There's also a negation function, which um, not zero is one, not one is zero, and that goes like this. And basically what we do is we compose these two, fun three functions, and we get this G function, okay? And let's just look what it says. Basically, G is... Take, take a villager, look at, its, look at its relationship with itself, see if it cuts its own hair. If it does cut its own hair, or if it doesn't cut its own hair, then see that it cuts its own hair. And basically, what G is, is the characteristic function. You'll see this in the next slide. It's the characteristic function of those villagers who do not shave their own hair. Okay? Do not shave their own hair. So that's the delta. Okay? And here I'm going through what I just said very carefully, and G is the characteristic function of the subset of villagers who do not cut their own hair. Okay, you can look at the Barber paradox also as a diagonalization thing, and basically it says as follows. Okay, um, imagine for a second that the Barber is not only a Barber, but he's a villager. So let's say he's V4, okay? And the ordinance says that Here's the di here's those things along the diagonal, and basically, this is um, v1 cuts his own hair, v2 does not cut his own hair, v3 cuts his own hair, um, v5 does not cut his own hair, vn does cut his own hair. Okay, and the village ordinance says that this diagonal row has to be the exact opposite of the barber's row. 
Okay, so you have a one here, you have a zero here. You have a zero here, you have a one here. You have a one here, you have a zero here. Okay, so the diagonal has to be different than the barber's row, the exact opposite. The problem is right over there. Where the diagonal meets this, then you have this problem. Okay, and it can't be the opposite, so that's why we put the question mark. So the problem is only by one villager, namely the barber. Okay, now Barber Paradox was supposedly made by Russell in order to describe Russell's paradox, and we're going to see the same format again. You know Russell's paradox, so I don't have to go through this slide, but again, you're going to have this function. It's going to be from a collection called set cross set to two, and basically one or zero, it's the exact thing, same thing. If S is if S is a member of S prime, if S is not a member of S prime, okay? And again, you have the same exact diagram over and over, okay? You're gonna look at how, what sets, whether they're not, whether or not they're an element of themselves and whether or not they're negated. Again, G is the composition of these three maps. G is the characteristic function of those sets that do not contain themselves, okay? Good. Again, we look at it as a matrix, a diagonalization, and basically you're looking at all the sets and seeing which ones are not an element of themselves. So then you're, you're, you're highlighting this and you're asking the following question. Is there a column which is the same as the diagonal? And the answer is no, there is no column that's the same as the diagonal. diagonal. The diagonal was or the change diagonal, the, the, the diagonal was changed in order to be different than the entire thing. Okay, now let's, let's formulate that a little bit more formal, and again, bringing in a new thing to get to Levere's theorem. Function g is represented by, uh, I'm sorry, function g is represented by, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, now I'm making a definition. Function g is represented by function f if there's a t such that g is equal to f of t. In other words, g has one input, f has two inputs. Question, can we find a t, hardwire the t, such that g is equal to f of t? Okay, now we can look at this in terms of matrices, and it says as follows. f is the matrix, the two-dimensional matrix, okay? And g is the diagonal. And f comma t with one variable is the teeth column. Okay, and so basically what you're asking is, is there a T, is there some column such that G is equal, the diagonal is equal to some of those, that column, and we say it's represented. Okay, we're asking if the diagonal is also a column of the matrix. Okay, okay, so we can go through the same thing with Russell's paradox, but you've seen Russell's paradox and you get the contradiction. Okay. Um, and the answer is, of course, no. The diagonal, those sets that do not belong to themselves, does not, is not uh, a column, and 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 therefore it does not, it's not a member of the of the of the set, the collection of sets. Okay, great. I want to do um, heterological paradox or the Grelling's paradox, which is again the self-reference, and again I'm sure you've seen it. It's about adjectives. And the question is, do, do the words um, describe themselves? English is English, French is not French, German is not German, Deutsch is Deutsch, abbreviated is abbreviated, unabbreviated is unabbreviated, hyphenated, some are, some, some are, some not. Okay, let's just do this quickly. Call all adjectives that describe themselves autological. In contrast, call all adjectives that do not describe themselves heterological. And so we get a nice seemingly um, separate grouping of adjectives, okay? Let's ask a simple question. Is heterological heterological? Okay, and you can go through the same thing. And the answer is, if yes, then no. If no, then yes. Okay, and again, it's the same format over and over again. You have this function from adjectives, cross adjectives to two, okay? And basically, adjective a and adjective a prime if a is described by a prime if a is not described by a prime and you have the exact same format and the function g is the characteristic function of those adjectives that do not describe themselves and then you can go on and talk about a matrix and talk about um, what describes themselves um, is there anything that represents it or not okay great 
we're not interested in in grilling at the moment we're interested in girdle and i'd like to show you how girdle's stuff fits into the same format okay so um you've seen this before basically the f function takes lindemann classes of 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 formulas a and b and plugs one into the other okay so you basically f of a f of b um sorry b of a of x b of x and you plug the girdleization of b into f of x this is this has no free variables and so that's a sentence Okay, great. That tells you what the function is. How are we going to change the diagonal? Okay, because that's the next thing. So you have alpha, which is going to go from Lindenbaum zero from sentences to sentences. And how is it going to change it? Okay, well, it depends on some E. Okay, some sentence for E. So alpha, depending on E, is going to take a sentence without any variable, and it's going to plug it in, and you're going to get, you're going to get such a formula. Okay. Okay. So that's the changing that you're doing to the diagonal. Okay. Well, let's look at this from the matrix point of view. If you have formulas A0, A1, A2, A3, A, so this is the first input. This is the second input. Okay. And basically you're plugging one formula into the other, the girdleization of one formula into the other. And then you, you are doing the di then you're changing the diagonal you're putting this e in the diagonal okay and so this diagonal's changed but lo and behold there is a column that represents this diagonal okay so there is a column that represents this diagonal okay and we can we highlight it in pink okay but what this does is it gives you this fixed point and this is this fixed point machine so um, let, let's just look at it a, a, a quicker way, okay? Here you're changing the diagonal. It's equal, the diagonal is equal to a column. And at this point where they meet, okay, you're going to have A of FPP is equal to FPP. So this is what Said was talking about this morning about this mysterious diagonalization. But I think if one can look at it, and and again, this is something like Sayyid so says, you know, you can you can't teach this without notes. Um, but if you look at it over and over, after a while you get it and then you lose it two days later. But but it but it it it, it can be done this way. Okay. So what we get out of this is this fixed point machine. Okay. And basically it says I have property E. And again, for Girdle, it says I'm a sentence that doesn't have a proof. I am unprovable. For Tarski, it says I'm false. And also Rohit Parikh has a set, has this interesting results, which I think is related to what uh, Harvey Friedman said about um, the finite Girdle um, thing is I do not have a proof of length less than N. I don't have any short proof. And he had some very interesting results about those types of things. And of course, there are many others. Okay, so that's, that's the logic. Um, I want to talk about Turing. And again, it's going to be the same formalism. Uh, but I'm bringing in Turing because of the of the alpha is very interesting okay so we assume that there is such a thing and cross uh there is there is a halting problem there's a way of solving the halting problem there's a computational way of solving the halting problem so you have you have inputs n cross n uh, programs and inputs and that goes to bool okay and so you get this function halt m cam n is one or zero if m in program n halts if per input m in program n does goes into an infinite loop okay great so that's the same type of function as we had before over and over and over again okay but now we have to change the diagonal as we did every single time and here's where it gets interesting i call it a partial not function basically if n is equal to zero then you have, in other words if you go into an infinite loop then output a one and if you halt then go into an infinite loop i i'm again i'm bringing this in because this is not in the category of sets and functions okay because this is in this category of sets and computable functions because we don't have this go into an infinite loop in the category so i'm trying to show that it doesn't just work in sets you have to go to a different type of category 
Okay. Okay. And uh, again, you have the same type of thing. Assuming this halt function, the halt function definitely exists. So the question is if it's computable. Okay. And then you change the diagonal just as before. Okay. But you change it in this paranoid. Okay. And again, you have the same exact setup. You have this diagonal, um, you have the hold function, and you get this hold prime function. And the hold prime function is basically um, another thing. We can see it here. It's, it's this program that outputs this. I'd like to say it as a self-referential statement. It says, if you ask me whether I will halt or go into an infinite loop, I will give you the wrong answer. That's what hold prime does. Okay. If you ask me if I, when you input my input and you will, will halt or go into an infinite, go in, halt or go into an infinite loop, I will give you the wrong answer. Okay. Um, so computers never give the wrong answer. Computers always do exactly what programmers tell them to do. It's programmers that make mistakes. Computers don't give the wrong answer. So halt prime cannot exist, and also halt cannot exist. Okay, so that's that's the point. Okay, so that's the end of our trollop um, through self-referential paradoxes, et cetera, et cetera. So Levere put all, this all together, and in a short paper, um, 11 pages in 1969, he wrote this paper called Diagonal Arguments in Cartesian Closed Categories. And I'd just like to say the main theorem, although it's hard to understand what it is, it's not an easy paper to read in any sense of the word. Um, in any Cartesian closed category, whatever that is, if there exists an object A and a weakly point surjective morphism, and he defines what this is, okay, so you have this function G from da da da, then Y has the fixed point property. Basically, there's a map that has this fixed point. I don't, you don't have to understand this. I, I want to explain why. You'll, you'll see it in an, a more understandable way in a slide. Okay, so in 1969, Levere did this, and he did Cantor's theorem, Russell's paradox, the non-definability of satisfiability, Tarski, and Gödel. Okay. Um, in 2003, I, uh, I tried to understand this paper, and I had a very hard time. So I, when I finally did understand it, I wrote another paper called A Universal Approach to Self-Referential Paradoxes, Incompleteness, and... Uh, fixed points, and it's a bulletin, whatever. And I'd like to say it now in Levere's theorem in a more understandable way. Let A be a category with a terminal object. That's a way of picking out uh, fixed points. And binary products, that means that cross, which means you have the diagonal. Let Y be an object in the category such that you can change things, be a morphism in the category. If alpha does not have fixed points, Okay, that's the main point. Okay, so let's do this last sentence important. If alpha does not have fixed points, then for all objects A and for all comparisons, these F functions, these matrices, there exists a diagonal and G is not represented by F. Okay, now this is most of the theorems, but you have to look also at the contrapositive of Levere's theorem to get Gödel's theorem. Okay. And let A be a category with terminal objects and binary products. Uh, let Y be an object in category and alpha be a morphism. Okay, now we're going to do the contrapositive. If there exists an object A and a morphism like that, comparison, and the diagonal is, this is the way we talk about the diagonal. If the diagonal is represented by F, then alpha has a fixed point. That's the fixed point machine. That's where Gödel comes in. That's where the the mysterious fixed point machine comes in, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And in this, in my paper, I went through all these different examples of these things, these 16 different examples of showing how they all show up. Gödel's first incompleteness theorem, Rice's theorem, Loeb's paradox, time travel paradoxes, but that's a little bit uh, hazy. Okay. Um, I, I also uh, recently wrote a book called Theoretical Computer Science for the Working Category Theorist, okay? And I have one chapter where I cover these things. And again, I do Turing's halting problems, a computable function that's not primitive recursive, so that's Ackerman's function, a total function that is not computable, the recursion theorem, the space hierarchy theorem, these are things from complexity theory, time hierarchy theory, the baker gill sullivan theorem, that's about P and NP relativized, and something called Ladner's theorem, which shows that if P is not equal to NP, then there are complexity classes between P and NP. Um, so, so these have a lot of uh, concept. This this same theorem has a lot of consequences in theoretical computer science. Okay, 
I just want to go through a little philosophy and start off with some basic things. Um, a paradox means it's an assumption, gives you a contradiction. Um, it's the same thing what mathematicians call proof by contradiction and philosophers call reductio ad absurdium. Okay. The question is, where do the, oh, and we, we have to, we have so far seen the same pattern of proof in many different areas. The assumption, the assumption is that the G function can be represented by F function. A contradiction is then derived when we conclude that G is not represented by F. The example high, the examples highlight the different areas where the alleged contradiction might be found. So I'd like to go through three different areas where you can have these contradictions. Okay. One is the physical universe. Okay. Turing, Turing's result is about um, computers, okay? Um, time travel paradox is about physical universe. The physical universe does not have any contradictions. Facts and properties simply are, and no object can have two opposing properties. Whenever we come to such contradictions in the physical universe, we have no choice but to conclude that the assumption was wrong. Okay, as opposed to that, the mental and linguistic universe, let's talk about that, in contrast to that, uh, the human mind and the human language um, that the mind uses to express itself are full of contradictions. We are not perfect machines. We have, we have many different contradictory parts and desires. We all have conflicting thoughts in our head, and these thoughts are expressed in our speech. So when an assumption brings us to a contradiction in our thought or language, we do not need to take it very seriously unless you're a librarian or an English professor. If an adjective is in two opposing classifications, it does not really bother us. In such a case, we cannot go back to our assumption and say it is wrong. The entire paradox can be ignored. Okay, but can, that's not always true. Science and mathematics. There are, however, parts of human thought and language which cannot tolerate contradictions namely science and mathematics. These areas of exact thought are what we use to discuss the physical world and more. If science and math are to discuss, describe, model, predict the contradiction-free physical universe, then we better make sure that no contradictions occur there. We first learned this in elementary school when our teacher proclaimed that we are not permitted to divide by zero. Every other number you're allowed to divide by, by, but not by zero. Since math and science cannot have contradictions, young fledglings, young children, are not permitted to divide by zero. To summarize, science and mathematics are products of the human mind and language, which we do, but we do not permit to have contradictions. If an assumption leads to a contradiction in science and math, then we must abandon the assumption. Okay, and so we have this pretty picture. The physical universe has no contradictions. Math and science, which predict or model the physical universe and more, also must, cannot have contradictions. But the mental and linguistic world is full of contradictions. Just speak to any politician. Okay. Okay, so why categories? Okay, so many have felt that these different instances of self-reference have a similar pattern. And, and for example, Bertrand Russell made up the Barber paradox so he can tell you about Russell's paradox. And uh, just going back to what was said in the last speech, um, you know, uh, Gödel, you know, said, "Oh, any any paradox can you, any any self-referential paradox can be used," and 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 it was asked whether or not that can be done for G two. Okay. The major advance that category theory has to, okay, so so many people felt that it was, you know, all these paradoxes are of similar nature, okay, but here we're giving an exact formulism, okay, the major advance that category theory has to offer is the, sub of self, uh, the subject of self-referential paradox is to actually show these different self-referential paradoxes are really instances of the same categorical theorem. So yes, it has a feeling of being the same thing, but here we're actually doing it. Levere described a simple formalism that showed many of the self-referential paradoxes. Okay, this also shows the unifying power of category theory. Okay, another positive aspect of our formalism, Levere showed how to have an exact mathematical description of paradoxes while avoiding messy statements about what exactly exists and what does not exist. In the categorical settings, the Barber paradox does not say that a village with a rule does not exist. With Russell's paradox, we do not say that a certain collection does not form a set. Okay, that's something that's, um, you know, why doesn't it form a set? I can describe it perfectly. 
Um, in the heterological paradox, we avoid the silly analysis as whether a word exists or does not exist. The word heterological is not technically a word because you can't tell a certain property of it. Okay. In our categorical discussion, we successfully avoid, we're just then in the categorical theorem, you're just discussing whether G is representable by F, yes or no. Okay. And so we don't have this um, uh, categorical. In our categorical discussion, we successfully avoid metaphysical gobbledygook. For this alone, we should be appreciative of categorical formulism. Okay. Now, um, the professor, the organizers uh, recommended that, uh, or suggested or asked, um, is category theory really necessary? Or is there some way of doing this? Okay, could all this have been done in some language without the language of category theory? Um, a similar question in physics and philosophy literature. Can quantum mechanics be done without the language of complex numbers? Short answer, yes, it can. We can, well, I'm answering the question about quantum mechanics. We can talk about a pairs of real numbers and as vector spaces, you have the following isomorphism. Re pairs of reals is isomorphic to the complex numbers. The problem is they're not isomorphic as algebras. Nevertheless, we can quote, do quantum mechanics without mentioning the complex numbers. We will have to bring in strange multiplication and it will be messier, but it can be done. Okay, similar question. Can we unify all these phenomena without bringing category theory? And the answer is yes, but it will not be easy. Okay, um, category theory makes things a lot easier. Let me explain to you. Um, I want to go back to discuss the founding of category theory. Category theory is a language formulated by Sammy Eilenberg and Saunders McLean. Eilenberg was a topologist, McLean was an algebraist, to make algebraic topology easier. Their aim was formulating a uniform assignment of algebraic structures to geometric structures. So you have topological spaces here, you have geometric, um, those are geometric, you have algebraic structures here, and then you have interesting ways of assigning called homology, cohomology, homotopy theory, K theory, etc. Doesn't matter what these things are. The only way to have such a language that can deal with both geometric objects and algebraic objects is to ensure that the language is about neither. This is exactly the power of category theory. It's abstractness, it's generality, it's, uh, what are they called, general abstract nonsense, permits it to deal with many different types of structures. Category theory can talk about everything because it is about nothing. Okay? The language of category theory is uniquely qualified to unify all these different instances. Um, that have been mentioned. I'm writing an introduction to category theory textbook right now, and I just want to read you the subtitle. It's called Monoidal Categories, a Unifying Concept in Mathematics, Physics, and Computing. Th these structures show up in all three of these areas. Okay, great. That's perfect. And I wrote this paper in 2003, and I get emails, and I've, over the years, I found a lot of things that do not fit into this thing, okay? Um, Brouwer's fixed point theorem, Kleene's fixed point theorem, um, Banach's fixed point theorem. I'm not. I don't. I don't have the time to to go through each one, but they're they're they are fixed point theorems, and they're remarkably not self-referential. And I cannot put them into Levere's thing. The Knast-Tarski theorem. I I put it in parentheses because I'm not sure I can. I, I'm still not sure I can do it, and maybe I'll talk about that later. Okay, what else does not fit in? I call these quasi-diagonal theorems, okay? A Euclid's proof of the infinity of primes, Zeno's paradox. You know, what does Zeno's paradox say? It says, oh, you can go further, you can go further, you, more than half, another half, another half, another half. Uh, proofs by infinite descent, okay? Actually, it says you can't go further, you can't go further, you can't go further. Model theoretic proofs of Gödel's second incompleteness theorem has a similar feel. Okay, the surprise test paradox, which was mentioned, Yablo's paradox, which which Paolo talked about, and there's um, in game theory there's something called the Brandenburger Kiesler game theory paradox, which also has this type of diagonalization theorem. Okay, I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to tell you a categorical way of of discussing these. Um, oops, hold on. Okay, hold on. Okay, so um, how is one to deal with all of these? They're all about recursion in some sense. Category theory is an interesting way of dealing with recursion. Let X be a collection, A an, an element of X, and G a function, 
So this is recursion. Fine, you know what recursion is. Let's define what a natural number object is. A natural number object is a number in uh, is an object in the category to be thought of as the numbers. It has a zero. It has a successor map. Okay, and so you can look at it as this. Okay, but it satisfies. Hold on. Oops. Sorry. It satisfies the following thing, namely for any other object X and map X like that, um, you have a unique H going like this. So, so let's go through this clearly. If you have an A map over here and you have a G map over here, then there's a unique map like this. And saying that these two diagrams commute basically says um, that this recursion happens. Okay, and there's generalizations of natural number objects, etc. Okay, notice what is going on here. Just a, a, a back into philosophy for a second. Notice what's going on here. The usual the way that one thinks about these things is that the natural numbers exist, and we can define a function on the natural numbers using recursion. Category theorists are doing something else. The natural numbers are defined as that object which with which one can do recursion. Okay, that's the definition of a natural number object. Okay, great. Now let's see how we can do this. Given a natural number object n in a category and an object x in a category, there are at least three interesting relationships worthy of study. Okay, we could talk about the map h from n to x. We're doing recursion. Okay, one thing we could say is it does not exist. There is no h. Okay, there's no h that makes these things commute. Another thing we can say about h is it's injective, and if you have the natural numbers, that means the image of h is infinite. Another thing you can say is it has a fixed point, okay? You have the natural numbers, and if h of n is equal to h of n plus 1, then it's constant forever and ever. Okay, so good. Now I'd like to go through some of these proofs um, some of these things that don't fit, fit into Levere's theorem into some into some other things. So let's talk about Euclid's proof of the infinity of prime. Let x be the natural numbers. A picks out a prime number. G goes from the natural numbers to the natural numbers as it follows. G of n is equal to the product of all primes less than n, okay, plus 1. Now that's not necessarily a prime number, but we have the following thing. There are more primes less than G of n than there are primes less than n. Okay, and the main point is the image of H is infinite, which goes, so this is a 2,000-year-old proof that there are infinite number of primes. Okay, but again, it's using this formalism. Okay, the, irrational, the irrationality of square root of 2. This is a proof by Stanley Tenenbaum. Assume wrongly that square root of 2 is a rational number, then you have square both sides and you get this, and A squared is equal to 2B squared. Okay, which means, I'm not sure... All of you have seen this before, so it's it's very pretty. So it's worthy of spending a minute. Uh, you have a giant square A, and you have two s smaller squares called B, and you assume A and B are the smallest to get the square root of two. Um, and you put the one square in this corner, you put one square in this corner. Now you have two problems here. One is you have an overlap over here, and two is you have smaller squares over here that are not covered. So we assume, since the area of the big one is equal to two of the areas of the small one, that this missed area can go in here, and this missed area can go in there, okay? And you'd get, again, a big square with two smaller squares getting there. Okay, so we assumed A and B were the smallest, and yet we get a smaller one, okay? Okay, I'd like to do this more with numbers. Basically, you're having a G, a function, that goes from pairs of numbers to pairs of numbers. It takes A comma B to 2B minus A and A minus B. That's figuring out what this area is and what this area is in terms of A and B. Okay, okay. some technical details here, which I don't have time to go through. And basically, you recurse along this G. And the point is, there is no original one. There's no first pair, okay? So this is an example where you cannot do recursion, okay? You cannot, that H doesn't exist, 
Okay, all proofs by infinite descent also are similar. For example, the proof of the irrational of the square root of k if it's not an integer. So take an integer, take k, take the square root. It's either an integer or it's irrational. It can't be rational. Okay, and the proof goes the same way. Okay, the surprise test paradox. I'm going to do it. I'm assuming you know what the surprise test paradox is. I'm going to do it point by point. Um, you know that the test is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, or Friday. Then you learn it's not Friday. Then you learn it's not Thursday. Then you learn it's not Tuesday, Wednesday. Then it's not Tuesday. And then it's not Monday. And this statement is a contradiction. This can be done in a more formal way. I got this from that um, paper that Saeed talked about, um, the surprise test paradox and Gödel's second incompleteness theorem. Um, basically, but again, you have this sequence of statements, and then you get a contradiction. Okay, so how are we going to talk about this in terms of this um, natural number object? So let's talk about it. Uh, so here's the logic part. Consider a pre-order X, which consists of sets of logical formulas ordered by implication. Notice that there are many bottom elements which contain contradictions. Okay, contradictions are on the bottom, and there are many of them. There is, however, a distinguished bottom element, um, bottom star, which contains all logical formulas. Okay, great. A function g from x to x takes a set of formulas to the consequences of the set. Okay, so notice that the set is a subset of the consequences. There are more consequences. In terms of the preorder, you have one, the g, the set of consequences of the formulas, is implies the set of formulas. In other words, you're going down in this preorder. You're going down in this preorder. If any set x is a contradiction, then g of x, that's a small x, goes to this distinguished bottom element. And in particular, g of x is a fixed point. So we're going to deal with a fixed point there. Okay. The function picks out some logical system, and the function h, we, we recurse, and the function h might go to the, this distinguished fixed point. Okay. So that's exactly what happens here. You have these you start off with the sequence of formulas. You go to the you go to the to the consequences of it. You go to the consequences of it. You go to the consequences of it. Go to the consequences of it, and finally you get to this contradiction. Okay, Yablo's paradox was done beautifully by Paolo this morning. I don't have to go through it again, but the same type of thing will go on again, and you get this contradiction. Okay, if you missed it, you should watch his talk. It was a very, very interesting. Okay, so let me just go through. And again, some of those other things can be, the, the fixed point theorems can all be done with this recursion. Um, okay, so let me just go through it. This is Levere's paper. Levere and Shanuel wrote a book called Conceptual Mathematics, and they do this stuff again. Levere also wrote a beautiful book called Sets for Mathematics, and it came out in 2003. And again, they revisited it. Parikh's paper about uh, short proofs is in existence and feasibility in arithmetic, which is an ex an amazing paper. Um, and my paper is Universal Approach to Self-Referential Paradoxes here. I also wrote a popular science book called The Outer Limits of Science, The Outer Limits of Reason, What Science, Math, and Logic Cannot Tell Us uh, by, K by MIT Press. And um, it's a more, uh, less technical thing. Um, that three areas of um, where paradoxes can happen is in this philosophy now, and I wrote this paper in the American Scientist. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>